we're going to uh, do the last event or the last session for this evening. And this is important. I hope I hope that you paid attention. Um, Jay, uh, Kevin will be interviewing these guys, drilling them with really hard questions. Uh, I don't know if, if you're in the, in the public and you have a question that's not being asked and is relevant and important, I think this is the time when you grab these two brothers and just don't let them leave the room until they give you an answer. Uh, Rav, Rav have, you, you have a question, right? About eschatology. <laughs> all right. Kevin, all yours. Okay, and just as a little background for anyone who isn't familiar, these are questions that we had members of our BCY ask at our last gathering. And we asked them to write down some questions they had on spiritual matters. So as said, Jake and Scott, I'm gonna be asking you to answer these questions and just to give some thoughts and just to start off right away. Our first question has to do with stewardship. And many of our members are younger at BCY and many who are here are younger. And it might be a bit difficult for them to contribute funds to their local assembly, especially if they're not of working age. So the question is that was asked is, how should I practice stewardship as a high school student? And do we either, either of you want to kick things off with some thoughts on that? Well, uh, one of the verses I thought of was uh, that what the Lord requires is according to what someone has, not what someone doesn't have. That's one of the principles that you give according to what you have. And so if you don't have, you know, uh, you shouldn't feel compelled to do something that you can't do. But then if you can do something, the principle that came to mind was that God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that you can do, just do it cheerfully uh, and do it according to what you have. And that, that'll, that'll please the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Um, so what came to my mind was the parable the Lord tells about uh, the servant and the talents. Everybody's given an amount to spend for the Lord. And the Lord's given us responsibility, right? Stewardship in at least three ways, right? Our time, we all have time to spend and we can't ever get it back, right? We can always make more money. We can't make more time. Talents, he's given you talents, abilities to use for him and treasures, physical treasures. Like, and as a high school student, like we said, you might not have that, but you certainly have talents that you can use for the Lord and you have time you can use for the Lord. And that's just it. We're to use them for the Lord, Right? If he's the master, if he's given you a stewardship, how am I using my time for him? How am I using my talents, whatever they are, for him? Mm -hmm. um, a little more on that would be, what does the Lord invest in? Right? What does he spend his time on? Number one is people. He cares about people. So how are you investing in people and for his kingdom? So that's how I would encourage a young person to spend, spend what they have. And they have a lot of time. You don't have that when you get older, especially when you have a family. So use it while you have it. For good answers from both of you. Thank you. Moving on to our second what question. A bad answer. You're going to tell us it's a bad answer. I might. Let's... I'm sorry. Incorrect. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> We're listening, Scott. <laughs> Moving on to our second question. So the Bible will contain passages that might speak in both the literal and figurative language. And sometimes it might be difficult for someone to determine which one scripture is using. So the next question asks, what is a good way to determine when the Bible is speaking figuratively or literally? And maybe uh, Jake, I'll have you start off if you have any thoughts first. Sure. So um, I think it's really important. Well, I've heard this recently and I absolutely love it. We know the golden rule, do unto others. So there's a golden rule of interpretation. Do unto authors as you'd have them do to you. In other words, when you speak, you want to be heard for what you say, what you mean. So we approach a text literally first, right? Because when we speak, we want to be taken for what we mean. Um, treat an author like you would want to be treated when you spoke, speak. It's also been said, if the plain sense makes perfect sense, don't try to make any other sense. The, the one other thing I would say is that uh, it's all about context. So when you look at a book, right? Because the Bible was written in books. What kind of book is it? Is it a book of history? Treat it like a book of history, right? Is it a book of poetry? Treat it like poetry. Is it a letter? 
treat it like a letter. One of the harder ones would be like Revelation. It's considered a uh, apocalyptic literature, and that gets a little more difficult. Um, but start there and then work your way down. Is the paragraph a, a, a story or is it commands, right? So context, context, context at the highest to the lowest level and treat authors the way you'd, you'd want to be treated when you speak. God spoke to us in a way we could understand. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add to that, uh, sometimes the passages will say, um, I saw something like, mm -hmm. And when you see that, you know, your, your attention is going to go up to that. This might not actually be, it's something like it. And so it's setting you up for how to think about something as you get ready to read it. Um, but I would say like the number one thing for, for me is the Holy spirit. He is the one that we just have to depend on him. As we go into the word of God, we have to depend on the spirit of God. And that means that it's like getting away from the question, but it really means that I have to be yielding to the spirit in my life as a way of life. So that when I turn to the scriptures, he's free to just interpret them, to show me what they mean. He's not obstructed because I'm harboring some kind of sin in my life. And yet, oh, I want to turn to the word and I want to understand it. Uh, we are so dependent on him that uh, it just carries through in every area of our life. If I really want success, that's going to be key because there's some, it's really hard things to, uh, to understand in the scriptures. We need his help. We really need his help. Hmm. Thank you both. Just thinking how you mentioned the spirit. And I think that was, that's great. Cause you know, in Galatians, it says the flesh is against the spirit. So if we don't have the spirit, we can't really hope to understand the scriptures as well. Yeah. So for our next question, and this was kind of touched on a little bit, but just to give some context, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts that the believers have. And our next question asks, how can Christians serve the church with their spiritual gifts? Scott, do you want to start things off? Again, when I was looking at some of these questions, a lot of uh, my answers came back to the Spirit of God. And as a believer, as you yield to the Spirit of God, uh, looking for Him to guide you in your life, these things are going to become more apparent. He's going to lead you. He has a desire to lead you, an interest to lead you. He dwells in you. And by means of his leading in the word of God, he will show you what to do. He will show you. If you want to follow, and you want to know what your gifts are and how you can serve, he will show you. And it might just take some time, but he will show you. In the meantime, if you're not really certain, just find any way to serve. I mean, just like if... if uh, uh, if there's a, something that needs to be cleaned or something needs to be taken over to someone's house or uh, Miss Irita needs someone to help park her car, you know, like just find a way to do something to serve and uh, and just help God's people. And as you're going along, uh, it'll become more and more clear to you what your gift is and how you might be able to use it. Yeah. Amen. And I agree, Scott, it, it does. You mentioned when you were speaking this evening about it being simple, the life of faith is very simple. And I know I, as I've grown is sometimes we overcomplicate things, right? My, my father told me once that we want fat Christians. We want fat Christians, faithful, meaning you do what you know. And I think we skip that a lot. We know a lot. We've been taught a lot from the word of God, especially in an assembly like this. Am I doing what I already know? How can I expect the Lord to give me more if I'm not being faithful with what he's already told me? A, available, right? If I'm locked up in a room or I'm hanging out with my friends, doing whatever, if I'm not available for the Lord to use me in the spiritual gifts he's given me, how can he use them if I'm not making myself available? So serve at camp, right? Show up at the meetings. Um, go to the saints' houses and, and then be teachable, T, right? Be ready to receive correction or instruction. If someone says to you, hey, I think you should do this, which by the way, is a gift of administration, right? Directing the ship, telling people maybe, hey, this is where you could fit in. Try it out. Try it out. I know in my own experience, the, the major way the Holy Spirit has worked in my wife, life is as I've been faithful to what I know, available to be used and teachable, I still don't know what my spiritual gifts are. I mean, you know what I mean? Like I'm not 100% confident but I'm confident the Lord uses me as I make myself available to him and it's to his glory. And that's what matters. Right? Thank you both for that. Moving on to our next question. This has to do with worry. And even though one is a Christian, it might not mean that they're immune to just a natural instinct to worry over things. 
maybe it's school for some people here, work, family struggles, health. So the question is that this person asked, and for the believer especially, what's the best way to overcome worry? Jake, I will turn it over to you if you want to start things off for this question. Uh, sure. Um, again, the life of faith is a life of dependence. And so a lot of these questions, really, they come back to just, uh, I think of Martha. And you know, I was having a conversation about, with somebody tonight about Martha. She was distressed and troubled with many things. She was serving the Lord. Why? The Lord Jesus told her why. She didn't take the necessary place. She didn't stop and spend time with her Lord and spend time with the Lord's people, with the Lord, right? So I would just start there. I mean, there's so many different directions it can go, but if we're not prioritizing our relationship with the Lord, meaning listening to him, looking for his voice as we read his word and not just doing it as a task, praying and asking him, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, open my eyes that I may see. You read the Psalms. David was in distress a lot. He had a lot of anxiety, but what did he do? He cast his cares on the Lord and was sustained because he'll never let the righteous fall. And that was a testimony of David in the Psalms. Yeah, and uh, casting those cares uh, in the form of praying, right? We yeah. we go to God and, and the Lord Jesus would say, he taught men uh, to pray and not lose heart. Mm. And so as we go and we spend time with God, uh, pouring ourselves out before him, pour out your heart before the Lord. Our God is a refuge for us. He is good uh, and he knows those who trust in him. So we come to him and we lay things out before him and it's very um, comforting. Uh, it's very helpful to spend time in his presence. In fact, the first answer that came to mind when I thought about answering that question was get to know God better. Mm -hmm. If you really want to like diminish your worrying, get to know him better and get closer to him because he has a way of just, <laughs> uh, just by his very presence and his character, just, just giving us great comfort and peace. So, uh, eliminates a lot of worry and just being near to him and knowing him. Thank you both for that. The next question is of a quite similar topic in it acts. How do I handle or control overthinking? And I'll open it up to either of you if you want to give some thoughts on that as well. Um, I guess the thing that came to mind again uh, was just spending time with God, uh, getting to know God. Uh, and it just has a way of bringing a calm uh, so that there's more that's just trusted to him more that's left with him uh, just because we know him and we've learned through experience that we can trust him uh, and it just helps diminish the amount of responsibility we feel we have personally to work through something because we really know him and we we know that he's for us we know that he's with us and that he's going to help us and there's a confidence there michelle and i have this little thing that we have said over the years that we're we're not in this alone and it's such a beautiful thing that as uh, you're trying to think through something, you're like, hey, wait a minute. I'm not in this by myself. The Lord is with me. He is for me. And uh, that's a great solace uh, and helps us to not overthink so much. But at the same time, it is good to think. Amen. Uh, it is good to think. So make sure sometimes we don't think enough. Uh, and the Holy Spirit, again, as we yield to him, he's going to help us to find that balance where we're not underthinking. We're not overthinking. I don't know what better answer that he is the answer. Uh, he is the one who can really help us get it right. Yeah, it makes me think of uh, was it Second Corinthians ten, where Paul talks about bringing under submission, under control, every thought and imagination to Christ. Yeah. Right. So we have these thoughts, and sometimes we get to get our, out of our head, so to speak, and into heaven. Right, where Christ, who is our life, is. Um, one way we learn the Lord, just to bounce off what Scott is saying, is yes, from his word, but another place where I have found the person of Christ and learned him from experiences through his people. Um, in the multitude of counselors, there's much wisdom. Find older believers. We need people our age, or it's helpful to have people our age that we can relate to, right? Like I have friends who are like, who are like David and Jonathan or like Timothy and Silas, right? But then we need the Pauls in our lives, 
right? We need the mentors in our lives. And sometimes they can help us take these thoughts that are in our heads or even our anxieties and put them in perspective. So to even sit here and listen to someone like Scott tonight, right? Scott's been there. He's walked that path and helped guide you. That's a way the Lord Jesus being present in a brother or sister can help lead you along. And that's the beauty of the church. It's the body of Christ, right? And so we don't want to neglect the older saints among us who have been there and done that, who can help us in our thinking. Um, I think just one other helpful thing to think, I think we can all benefit from this is that when we think of our, think about our thinking, the first story you tell yourself, we start to put ideas together. Sometimes we analyze, get really analytical about, Hey, why did this happen? What's going on? The first draft of anything you write is always the worst draft. Mm. So it's always good to remember that just from a, a psychological standpoint, right? Like just remember the story you tell yourself, we're really good at putting stories together in our mind, but we're not good at being right about them, right? So again, coming back to that, bringing those thoughts captive to Christ and realizing just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. I need some help. I need some support. Thank you both for that. Moving on to the next question. This one asks, how can I offer help to non-believers that have lost a loved one? And Jake, would you like to start us off with that one? Sure. This is, uh, loss is hard. And every situation is different. But you look at how the Lord dealt with people. And he dealt everyone with everyone as individuals. It's important as Christians that we don't become so analytical that we forget we're dealing with human beings, flesh and blood. And it doesn't matter if they're a believer or unbeliever loss hurts. So first I was talking to my wife about this and we were talking about first Corinthians 13, love being patient, being kind, enduring with them. I think another, so be loving also Job, when he was going through loss, his friends were much better off for him when they were silent. And, I was actually thinking about the same thing. <laughs> amen. Yeah. Um, so there's nothing wrong. Look, Titus, Paul talks to Titus about making the gospel look good. He says, adorning the gospel with good works. The, the word there is for like putting on makeup, right? Ladies, you put on makeup because you think it makes you look better. God thinks the same thing about his gospel. It looks better when it's accompanied by good works. And sometimes that time of silence, that time of just being present um, and being a good friend opens up opportunities. You know, we have to wait on the Lord. And we need to pray, obviously, pray, pray, pray for these people. But some some things that I think are helpful. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yes. Very good. Scott agrees. Okay. We'll move on then. And so this next question, the topic is baptism. And specifically, it asks, why is it important to be baptized? Why should you be? What is the meaning? So I'll open up to either of you if you want to give any thoughts on baptism and why a believer should be baptized? Well, we believe that we should be because we see it in the scriptures. We see the Lord uh, teach it and command it. And uh, it seems that he desires this outward display of something that's happened uh, in the unseen realm of a person, uh, spiritually speaking. They have, they have uh, been baptized into the death of Christ um, they're associated with him and identified with him in his death. But the wonderful thing that's, that, that comes with being identified with the death of Christ is that he rose. <laughs> so those who are identified with his death are also identified with his resurrection. And now they have new life. And so in baptism, we're just showing that to others, that this is what's happened. You go down into the waters and it's like you, the person disappears for a second. And it's like the water is like the ground and they're being buried. And then they get brought back out of the water and it's like they're raising from the dead. And everyone gets to see a visual of what's taken place, that they've been saved. They've been baptized into Christ and raised in him to walk in new life. So that's a great opportunity for people to see what's happened to us um, when we got saved. Yeah, and I don't think we need to complicate it. Uh, so to say, I think Scott has said enough just to highlight, um, even when we don't understand something, because I know this was hard for me and I know it's hard for a lot of people. The Lord commanded believers to go and baptize others in the same passage. He said, 
all authority has been given unto me and he commanded them to go. So I just want to highlight that obedience part. In other words, if your Lord, your master has said, believe and be baptized, do it. And the, you, know, you can understand the rest. No, it doesn't change anything. All it is, is it's, it's obedience and everything Scott said is true, but it's good to obey. It's so good and so important to take our God, our Lord in faith. He said it, I believe it. And that settles it. Thank you both for that. Moving on in first Peter three, Peter says that a believer should always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And for a new believer, it might be difficult to fully understand scripture and even to give a defense of the gospel in the face of opposition. So our question asks, what books slash passages in scripture can best equip a believer to defend the gospel and their faith? And Scott, I'll let you start off. Uh, I, I went to, my first thoughts went to just knowing the scriptures, all of it. I mean, just, I mean, I know it takes time, but just letting the whole word of God just become familiar to us. And it just has a way of uh, giving us a great understanding. And I think what happens with people that come to us naturally in the course of life that have questions, the Lord knows where we're at. He knows what we know. He knows what we don't know. And uh, he can orchestrate conversations and interactions with others who maybe have questions. And he knows that that we we can answer it. We might not know the answer to that question over there, but uh, he, it seems very reasonable that he's going to lead us into conversations and relationships. Whereas if we are just devoted to the word of God and reading it and meditating on it, we're learning. God's going to use that information. He's going to use that to help someone else. Even someone that maybe has a doubt or a question about something and they're a skeptic. God's, God knows where we're at and he is fully able to use us in the circumstances that he leads us into. And if we don't know, it's totally okay to say you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally, I remember some of you know Randy Amos. I remember he said that one time he was at a Bible study and he got finished teaching all this teaching. It was like over an hour or whatever. He was expounding on all different things. And someone came up to him after and said, you know what impressed me most that you said? And he's thinking, well, maybe it was when I was discussing the, the dispensations or maybe it was unfolding the prophecies of Daniel. I, mean, I think he was joking. He wasn't really thinking that. But the person said, what impressed me the most when someone asked you something and you said, I don't know. That impressed me more than anything else. And so just the humility and the, the place that we don't know everything. So if someone asks you a question and you're not sure how to answer it, you can say, you know what? I don't know. And then maybe you go research it and you study it, you find out and you come back to them. That's perfectly legitimate, you guys. Perfectly legitimate to do. Yeah, amen. I have nothing to add on that. I agree. It's very good, yeah. Moving on to the next question. This one is related to fellowship. It says, since God gives us all things, does he understand when our life gets very busy and we are physically unable to attend fellowship opportunities? I still have my time with the Lord, but sometimes I feel sad I don't spend that much time. So, Jake, do you have any comments on that one? Yeah, um, this is a question that I think would best be answered in a conversation with the person. Mm. Right. Because what do you mean? Like, what are you going through? Every Again, we're dealing with people. Right. Everybody's situation is different. The Lord's working with us in different places. Um, so there, there, there's an assumption in the question. All right. So I want to come back to this and just say, God gives us all things. Does he understand when our life gets busy? And the, the assumption there is if he's giving it to me, does he understand if I'm, of course, right. If God's giving you something, of course he understands. He gave it to you. Now I think the question might be more, am I allowed to be so busy that I don't have time for fellowship with the saints. Our life does come with ebbs and flows and there will be seasons of our life where maybe we're more busy, but I think we need to be cautious of excusing our action for obedience, excusing our action for obedience. In other words, just because we're busy doesn't mean we're doing what God wants us to do because he has commanded us to rest too. Right. He's he commanded his servants to come apart and rest for a while. And he did. They did end up working while they were resting, which is interesting. Um, the other story, the account that comes to mind is the Lord Jesus 
in Mark chapter one, you spend a weekend with him. It's when he heals uh, Peter's mother and he's just busy, 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 busy. And in the morning, early in the morning, the disciples are looking for him and they're like, Lord, everybody's looking for you. Busy. Let's go. The Lord was communing with his father. He paused. And when he got up, he said, okay, all these people are looking for me. We're going to another place. Lord, what about all these people? Our schedules need to be dictated by the Lord, right? Doing the things that he wants us to do, which again, only comes with communion with him. And we need to be ready for divine interruptions too. That's what William McDonald calls them, divine interruptions. Our schedules may change, but Hebrews tells us that we cannot neglect the assembling of ourselves together. And that is what some people do is what the verse says. It acknowledges that but we should gather all the more and encourage one another. All the more is also part of that as we see the day of the Lord's coming approaching. So again, I think it'd be better to answer with the individual person, but just some things to think about. And I guess the only thing I would add is just, uh, if that's really your heart and praise God for that, that's a beautiful heart to have Amen. that you want it, yeah. that you want it. Maybe you don't see the way clear to do it, and you're a little bit disappointed because you want it, but you don't have it. I just want to make mention that the desire of your heart is such a beautiful thing. So take it to the Lord, pray about it, and just tell him about it. He'll he'll show you what to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for that. So for the next question, in a believer's life, there might come a time where they are not in fellowship with God like they once were. And they do not take the time to pray to him, maybe, or read his word. So the question asks, how does someone reconnect with God after being separated? Jake, do you want to start things off for us with that one? Sure. And this definitely won't be all inclusive, but um, speaking of the heart, praise God that you desire to reconnect with the Lord um, and be encouraged in this, that while you may have stepped away from your relationship with him, the Lord Jesus promised he will never leave you or forsake you. He didn't go anywhere. And so when it comes to reconnecting, the only thing that needs to change is on your part. And that's a beautiful thing because it's not like you have to come halfway for the Lord. The Lord's gone all the way. He's with you. And now it's just a matter of, I think a lot of it starts with confession. Just be honest with the Lord. He already knows he's there. And that is the beauty. First John talks about walking in the light. And if you walk in the light, you never come out of the light, right? When you fall, you fall in the light, right? You're, he's always there. You're always in the light. And so it's just about, First John talks about confessing or acknowledging your sin, and he's faithful. And he can also be just because he took the penalty in forgiving you your sins. And not only that, but it says there's a promise of cleaning you up, cleansing you so it's less likely to happen again. And so take that as a promise from God. Good answer. It's a good answer. Scott agrees again. Very good. Thank you. One more question we have. We have two more that are written down, so we're almost done. The next next one has to do with something that's probably on the minds of many of the youth today, and it, many here maybe even. It asks, what does the Bible teach on dating? So I'll open up this one to both of you again. Any feedback in regards to the Bible mentioning dating or relationships? Someone said, someone said get married <laughs> yeah. oh is that what you said get married <laughs> uh yeah there's not much on dating i don't think it's a simple question <laughs> no it doesn't talk about dating moving on <laughs> but yeah like well i'll just something i recently heard or read was uh first off obviously the the goal is marriage that's that should be on the mind like if you're not thinking that if if that's not what you're aiming for, uh, it's just not going to be pleasing to God, um, entering into any other relationship unless that's the goal, but it's, it's, you have to do it the right way. And it has to be someone who is a believer. Um, and, uh, we cannot be unequally yoked. That's just, you got to know that if you are going to pursue something with someone that's not a believer and you're a Christian, you're out of the will of God, you're out of the will of God and it's going to be trouble. Okay. So it has to be 
in the Lord, but then someone has written and of the Lord. If you're going to pursue a relationship, it has to be someone who the relationship has to be in the Lord, meaning you're both saved. And it also has to be of the Lord. He has to be the one that's really like leading you can't just do whatever you want and say, I could just go after any relationship I want just because they're a Christian. In every area of life, you want to follow the Lord. So it has to be in the Lord and of the Lord. And then you just have to have that mentality that uh, I'm in this because I'm seeking a spouse, not just because I you know, want to have fun with someone of the opposite sex. So, Yeah, and there's a lot we could say on this because I think our culture really, really, really gets this wrong. Um realize that dating is a cultural thing, right? Um, there are some cultures where it's arranged by the parents. What's what's makes one better than the other from a biblical standpoint? Nothing, nothing. But realize that when our country started, the culture wasn't dating, it was courtship. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm saying there's a different focus. You went into the home of the woman to see how she interacted with her family why? Because you were going to build a family. But then why, why did, where did dating kind of come in historically? It kind of comes in when people have this miraculous thing called free time where they can go out and they have extra spending money because we're industrialized, right? People have this extra cash. So they go out, they consume milkshakes, maybe a hamburger, <laughs> right? And they spend time together because now we're looking not for a family, but for partnership, which isn't terrible either. But then we get to the 1960s and the free love movement. And now it's about what pleases me in the moment. And when you stop pleasing me in the moment, we can separate. So you see, we get further and further away from, from the ideal, from the goal. And so when we even think about dating in the first place, number one, yes, it's all about we're heading to marriage. Um, but number two, I think, how do I treat a woman? How do I treat a man? First Timothy chapter five says, we should treat younger women like sisters and older women like our mothers. So if you're with a girl you're not married with, and you're not treating her like your sister, you're out of the will of God. It's respect. And those go for the women or men you see on your phones too. If you're looking at them at ways that you wouldn't look at your own sister, you're wrong. Marriage is something different. Marriage is beautiful and it's special and it's one-to-one. -one. Um. And I think that's a great way to think about it. Because if you're sitting here thinking, well, I would never think about my girlfriend like my sister, you're the one who's messed up in your thinking, right? Um, because you are friends first and you become more than that later, right? Thank you both for, the, both for that. This next and last question, definitely the most interesting and maybe we can spin it in a different way. But I'll just ask it as it says. It says, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It's going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah. Said it was definitely the most interesting. <laughs> any any feedback at all? I'm going with the chicken. Chicken. Genesis 121. He created birds. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good point. I think that answers he that. He created eggs. He created birds. If we want to talk about... Um, Microevolution, we can do that offline, but that might take a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the last question that I was provided. And I think I don't know if we'll open it up to any other questions, maybe put you guys in the spot a little. We'll see. Ezekiel, are we going to be doing any more questions? Raise your hand if you have a question that you want to answer. Okay. Make it short. But uh give you uh okay. I guess stand out and ask the question. So this is, kind of, this is personal for me because it definitely can be applied to anyone, maybe now the rise or later. How, how would you recommend us structurally seeking out God um, when we're completely on our own? Like, oh, I I spent time with God on this day because of this reason, seeking this. Because I uh, number one, I, re I was raised in an unbelieving household, so it's already hard enough. Um, Having to kind of learn how to be a man of God almost on my own, of course, not without God. But number two, I'm going to be on my own. And I don't know how frequently, number one, in what way I should be seeking God about certain things. And number two, I don't know if I'm always going to have the time, depending on what my life will look like. I believe that's something that will apply to everyone, maybe not necessarily now, at some point in their lives. 
Can you summarize that question? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, like, how do you develop uh, time with the Lord when you're on your own? Yeah, yeah, like quality time in the middle. If you're asking the the more important questions, I guess you can say. Not that any question isn't important, but more something that helps you stay upright and dependent on God, but not the least God, having Him do everything. Mm. Well, I'm not sure. And the one thing I'm thinking to say is that if if you are determined to spend time with the Lord, if you're determined and you you carve out that time, you make that time. It makes me go back to the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha's like, "Tell her to help me," and the Lord would not take her from that place. The Lord would not take her from that place. She was at His feet. Mary was. She was spending time there. And the Lord said, I am not taking that from her. If you want that time with the Lord, he will protect that time. He will protect that time and help secure that time that you want to have with him. He'll help you to have it. Of course, it, we have to be determined and disciplined, but the Lord is for us in that. And he will help protect that. Uh, so it, it's just good to know his perspective on it. All right. Was there any questions? Yeah, um, you got mentioned earlier uh, what a uh, fat Christian, but you forgot to mention the T. You got faithful, teachable, uh, teachable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that answers that. And I guess no more, no more questions. So, Scott, Jake, thank you very much for answering these questions. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Maybe could we, are we going to close in, a, in some prayer? That'd be good. Would you like me to? All right, let's, let's pray. So, Father, it's so important to us now to pray to you because we've talked about it so much this evening. And it's sometimes we confess it's, we, we can talk a lot. I say for myself, Lord, I can say a lot. Um, but when it comes to acting on it, even with you, Lord, we often fall short. You were such a gracious and loving God. We thank you for your grace uh, because your grace allows us to fail and still continue. Your mercies are renewed every day. Your throne for us is not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. And we're so thankful that your son, as he came, revealed you as a God who is full of grace while still being full of truth. You could tell the woman caught in the act of adultery, I don't contempt, condemn you. And at the same time say, go and sin no more. So Lord, we believe, but we ask that you help our unbelief, that you grow us into Christians who are mature, who are more like the Lord Jesus, not just in our thoughts, but in our actions, in, in our words, and not just in our words, but in the way we speak. We ask that you bless everyone here this evening with a relationship with you. For those, Father, who have not trusted you as their Savior, who have not taken the work of Christ on the cross and applied that blood to themselves, knowing it has paid the penalty for their sin, we pray they would they would receive that free gift this evening, simply trusting in what Christ did and nothing else. Uh, we just pray for safety on the road and travel. Uh, we pray, Father, especially for the youth among us, that you would grow them up, that they'd be nurtured by you. We thank you for the heart that was demonstrated in so many of the questions this evening, a desire for you, a desire for relationship with you. We pray that you help them carve out time, that you would protect that time, and that as life comes with its ebbs and flows, that you would keep them in your will, keep them with you, and give continue to give that desire for you. And we pray, Lord, that as they run the race, they would look to the right and left and find a super... Uh, suitable helper for those you would desire to be married. And Father, for those who are not married, we pray that you'd make them content in their state, that they might serve you where they are and maximize their time for you. We ask it in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.